Well, we are in uh, September now, 2024, and many of you have heard of the federal budget that changed the inclusion rate on capital gains that took effect on June 25th, 2024. And a lot of my colleagues, uh, whether they are in medicine, nurse practitioners, even my friends who own small businesses are asking, what does this really mean? In fact, it has been stirring a lot of controversies since its validation in June. And I must say that the news is not very good. So here, what we're going to do today is we're going to speak with a tax expert. So my good friend, Norma, who's going to be talking to us about what does this increase in the capital gains inclusion rate really means to small business owners and physicians and healthcare professionals who are incorporated. I must remind everyone that this is not just about physicians. This is about all people who have incorporations. So physicians, dentists, optometrists, physios, nurse practitioners, mom and pop who operate a small business under a corporation. This increase affects us all. And today we're going to learn how it does that. So please enjoy and um, reflect a little bit on what is going to be said and take action if you need. How's my financial health, Doc? Welcome to the Financial Literacy Podcast for healthcare professionals where financial security and wealth topics are not a taboo. Okay, so good morning, everybody. And I am back. I am your host, Vukia Tran. This is the How Is My Financial Health Doc podcast. And uh, today we're going to be talking about taxes. Um, you know what? I love to talk about taxes. Funny, because I like to talk about medicine, but for some reason, I also like to talk about taxes. And when I talk about taxes, I can only think of one friend that I can talk to, and that is Norma, Norma Ull. Norma, uh, how are you doing? I am doing great. Thank you, Dr. Vu. And uh, yeah, here at Hool & Associates, it's all about uh, taxes for us to minimizing and we say it's uh, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I will disagree with you on one thing. Please don't call me Dr. Vu. Just call me Vu, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, you are in Ottawa. And, and Ottawa is the epicenter of taxes because that's, that's where they come up with these ideas. And so... Yeah. So now uh, I'm putting sort of you on the hot seat because I equate Ottawa to these people are trying to take money away from me. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. I mean, everybody still has to pay their fair share, but uh, my goal is really to minimize the pain, if you, if we can use that phrase. <laughs> and I agree with you, the fair share. That's that's really the, the key word. But there have been some recent changes uh, in the federal tax this year. Uh, that happened on June 25th. So I think what's happening is that within the physician community, we've been hearing from our accountants, I would say for at least a good year to almost two years, you know, the increase in capital gains inclusion rate is coming, the increase is coming, the increase is coming. And finally, it came. Uh, and it came and it hit us on June 25th of this year. Right. It was introduced uh, with the federal budget. Uh, there was presented on April 16th, and I can tell you and our listeners that uh, for every day from April 16th to June 26th even, I was getting calls daily from our clients and or their advisors saying, okay, what's happening? Something hit the wall, and how do we mitigate? Maybe just uh, one or two sentences. 
why are we paying so much attention to this uh, new uh, increase in capital gains inclusion rate? What in in just very high level? Why is it so important that we need to know this? Well, because a lot of people have investments uh, that trigger capital gains. So basically, a capital gain is the difference between what you're selling versus what you paid for it is some people call it a profit uh, for tax purposes. We call it a capital gain. And up until June 25th, only half or 50 percent of that gain was taxable. But as of June 25th and, and beyond, uh, now the government wants to make it two thirds taxable. So now all of a sudden you're going from 50 percent to 66.6 percent taxable amount. So it's it's taking away part of your savings in some cases because people have investments out there that are accounting for retirement or other other uh, future goals and so this is uh, kind of a kick in the shins for somebody who's been working hard and saving all these years so what i understand is so it's a, it's a new tax uh, it's an increase in tax so we, we think from 50% to 66.6 so that's that's a 16.6% on 50%. That's a really extremely high jump, high increase. And this means less money in my pocket at the end of the day, really. That's what that means. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at the history of the taxable capital gains, at one point, it was actually at 75%. Um, so I think there might have been some negotiating when the government absolutely wanted to raise it above 50 but probably didn't want to go as high as 75 because some people need to get reelected. <laughs> uh, that's funny. That's funny. Okay. So now that we've had the, a little bit of a laugh and a 30,000 foot view. So what exactly was the change? Let's repeat it again, uh, but more in a more formalized way. What was exactly the change that occurred in on June 25th? So essentially if you uh, had a cap, have a capital gain, on June 25th and beyond, no longer is the capital gain only 50% taxable, it's two thirds taxable. That means, for instance, if, if I have a $100 gain, instead of paying tax on $50, now I'm paying tax on $66 uh, or two thirds of it. So you're paying tax on more, uh, it could potentially bump you up into the next tax bracket uh, for some people. Now, the government also introduced kind of a concession with regards to the capital gains rules if you're an individual versus earning capital gains inside a corporation if you're an individual what they what they proposed was that on the first $250,000 of a capital gain in in a year uh, as an individual you're still going to get to use the what they call the old rules so basically the first 250,000 of a gain is taxed at 50%, but anything above 250,000 will be taxed at the two thirds. Whereas in a side of corporation, there is no limit. It's that first dollar of a capital gain is gonna be taxed at two thirds. There is no buffer or there is no going back to the old rules uh, of 50% taxable. Uh, the first dollar of a capital gain earned inside a corporation is now being taxed at two thirds. Okay, so thank you for explaining that. I'm going to unpack that a little bit just for our audience. So I'm going to use the $100 example for now. So I've got a, a profit or a gain of $100 in the old rules. So January 24th, not 25th, January 24th, the day before, if I if I had a capital gain of 100 so 50% of that is taxable. So I will be taxed on $50, but at my tax rate. So Correct. if if I'm a physician, for example, and I let's say it's 53, but I would just keep it at 50. So it's 50% of that $50. So my tax at that uh, on that $100 is $25. So I made a gain of $100, but I have to pay $25 in taxes. And therefore, I can only keep 75. That's what Correct. I keep in. That's what I keep in my pocket. That's right. Yes. Now on June 26th, the day after, you know, apocalypse day, out of that uh, out of that uh, $100, I'm now the taxable portion is 66%, so it's $66. And now I'm taxed at my tax rate which is 50%. So now it's 50% of that $66, which means 33. So I have to pay $33 in taxes 
which means in my pocket, I keep uh, 67. Correct. Right? That you got it. Uh, so before that, I kept $75. But now, after Apocalypse Day, I keep $67. That's right. That's what that yeah, means. So some, yeah, so some people are saying, well, it's it's only an 8% difference. Well, it's 8%, but it's every year or whenever you trigger these capital gains. So your savings, if you will, just took an 8% dive, <laughs> if you will, you know, when, when this change was introduced. Yeah, but you think about it, 8%, if if the average market is about 8% every year, and now you've taxed me 8%, in, in, in essence, I've made nothing this year. Correct. <laughs> yeah, kind of balances out. Right. So someone, someone in Ottawa really likes my money. So let's come back to the personal versus professional. So mm -hmm. what you're saying is, okay, let's take the uh, the example of a, of a house, of a real estate. So I bought my real estate. It was a million dollars back then, and now it's worth $3 million. So I'm going to decide to sell. So in the in the personal hand, I made a gain of two of two million, but the first two hundred and fifty thousand is only uh, included fifty percent, right? And and the other one point seven five million is now included in the sixty six percent, right? Okay, so that's what that new changes. Whereas before, before this. Um, the entire two million would have been taxed at fifty percent. So the inclusion rate would have been fifty percent, right? And then, and then, out of that fifty percent, what is my personal tax rate on that on that dollar? Yeah, exactly. So you're you if you if you're still at that fifty percent rate, the the two million dollar gain taxed at fifty percent, you would have paid tax on one million, and so your out of pocket would have been half a million dollars. Correct. But but you got three million on the sale. So, you know, so you're you're left with two point five in your pocket. Whereas Correct. now now the rule says no, two thirds is taxable. So not just one million, but one point one, almost one point two million is taxable. Cut that in half. Now you're paying six hundred thousand thereabouts in taxes as opposed to five hundred thousand. So again, it's it's taking money away from you, you know, when you thought that, wow, you know, I was going to make a huge profit going from a million to three million on my real estate investment. But the government's saying, no, it's not quite as high as it used to be. Right. So now in the personal hands, I at least have that 250,000 buffer that follows the old rules. Correct. But I'll use the same example in the professional. So... I'm a, I'm a dentist and, mm -hmm. and I own a building because that's where I practice. I own the building. I bought it at a million. Now it's worth 3 million. I, and now the entire profit or gain 2 million is now included in the 66%. There's no buffer of the first 250,000 in the professional case, in the incorporated case. That's right. There's no, yeah, there's no first uh, 250,000 under the old rules. Uh, does not apply to corporations, right? Or capital gains inside a corporation anymore. Right. So I guess the idea of doing this was to give the personal, the person, the individual a little bit of a break, uh, but they didn't want to give that break to uh, corporations. That's uh, as plain as day. That's right. That's exactly what it is. Uh, obviously, again, we're talking about people in Ottawa, finance department making calculations and the two hundred fifty thousand dollar limit for individuals earning capital gains. Um, you know, there, there's some calculations as statistically how many people is it going to affect. Uh, you know, people trading in or cashing in uh, stocks, or uh, I'm getting clients that are selling cottages. Right, we've got an aging population, and now mom and dad are selling the cottage to the kids or or to third parties. And so they're trying to give individuals a bit of a break and saying, okay, on the first $250,000 of the capital gain, you can still use the old rules. Now, the fact that they're targeting, you know, corporations and 
you know, when I say corporations, it's not just the big IBMs of the world or the big Fords of the world. We're talking about mom and pop who owns um, a Tim Hortons, a mom and pop who owns a convenience store, a farmer, a, a single mom who owns a small business. Those are still corporations. Absolutely. And yes. so, so this new rule against the corporations affect individuals, not just major IBM Fords of the world. Oh, absolutely. You're right. And uh, it's it's all, you know, the, the, the tagline the government likes to use is we're all for the middleman uh, or the middle class. And but this is where it's hitting the most, because, you know, a lot of a lot of middle class families, you know, small business owners, like you described, have these corporations in place. And, you know, they've been using these corporations to invest and kind of set aside money for retirement. But now all of a sudden they're losing, as we calculated earlier, about eight percent of that chunk is or an additional eight percent is going to the government. Now it's interesting that they did that because maybe maybe it's well known, and I just learned this recently, but the entire Canadian economy falls on the on the burden of small business, not big business. Like there's there's just a, a handful of Google and IBM and Ford and Honda and Toyota out there. Otherwise, the entire Canadian economy falls on the on the burden of small and medium sized companies, and so for them to do that, it, it's an attack on these small businesses. So, what was the idea behind this? Votes, <laughs> vote. plain and simple. Plain and simple. People vote. Corporations don't vote. Um, that's my personal opinion. But at the end of the day, uh, it it was also to differentiate. Uh, you know capital gains earned by an individual versus capital gains earned, in, earned inside a corporation. And I think there's a myth out there. Corporations can reduce their taxes, have, you know, other means of, of uh, you know, ultimately reducing taxes for the, for the business, for the owners. So, you know, do they need a break? Well, you know, again, is our tax system really fair? You know, that's up for grabs. Right, right. And I think, and I think the the misconception, uh, like you mentioned, is that when we think of corporations, we think of these big giants, uh, but we don't think of the mom and pop and the single mom and the single dad and 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 these families who own a, a mechanic store or a convenience store. We don't think of those people, and that's the Correct. I think that's a misconception. Absolutely, and and even you know professionals like uh, like yourself and I, accountants, doctors, lawyers, dentists. Um, again, where it's uh, there's that perception that you know um, you know eight percent is not going to hurt us, which again is is, is you know a, a misconception by these I'll say decision makers. Yeah, yeah. So now we've talked about the difference between personal and professional, and now we're going to jump into the assets. So what assets do these actually affect? So if I'm um, I'm a person and I have a savings account. Or uh, I have I've invested in GICs. So what are the assets that this will actually impact on? Yeah, so it's really a, a, a new tax rule around capital gains. And as I mentioned, so a capital gain by definition is the difference between what you sell and what you purchased. Um, so it mainly hits stocks, uh, capital assets like uh, rental properties or cottages, things like that. Um, if you only have a bank account and you're earning interest, interest is going to be fully taxable. Uh, if you got GICs, that's fully taxable, things like that. Or if you have investments that are paying you dividends, let's say the dividends are, are taxable as well. Uh, they don't fall under these capital gains rules in a sense, but it's only when you're, you buy low, sell high, just, you know, to, to keep it simple. If, if you're buying something to resell at a profit, that'll be a capital gain. Now, the biggest exemption I'll say is is your personal residence. So if I, you know, buy a home and and I paid 100,000 for it and today it's worth 250,000, I don't pay tax on that gain because it was my principal residence. I lived there. But if I bought a rental property for that 100,000 and it's worth 250 today, well, if I decide to sell it, I'm looking at a $150,000 capital gain where two thirds is taxable. So I'm going to be paying tax on $100,000 today because we're beyond the June 25th date. 
And so um, that's, you know, that's less attractive now uh, under the new rules. Right. Now, th that's an important point. I mean, so things that have uh, an interest or dividends do not fall within this new change. It fall. It has. It hasn't changed. Interest and dividends are taxed differently, and that hasn't changed. Right. What What has really changed is anything that appreciated in value that had a capital gain. So stocks, uh, mutual funds, you uh, mutual fund units, uh, ETFs, uh, yep. index funds, all those that have a capital gain will be trapped within this new rule. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've mentioned real estate rental properties. Yeah. A lot of a lot of um, mom and pop and families uh, have invested in in real estate when they were younger, uh, bought rental units, and now they decide, you know what, it's time to retire, uh, and they want to retire and sell those units as their retirement fund, and this is where they get hit with that mm -hmm. with that capital gain. Yeah, unfortunately, now, and they've, and they've been paying tax on the rental income all these years as well. And that's right. Uh, you know, that's personally. Right. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it is definitely, um, you know, disappointing for, for those people that were counting on, on these gains or the appreciation of the values uh, over time. And, and now what do I do? I want to retire and now I'm paying more tax than, than expected. So what that means for individuals is either they take the hit or they'll say, well, I have to work for a few more years because I need to accumulate more. So instead of uh, retiring at 65, they'll retire at 68 or 69 or even 70 because they need to build that back, that 8% <laughs> to build it back. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. Now, on the professional side, uh, traditionally what has happened is that back in the day, and this is probably before I was a, a physician, was the fact that we were given the opportunity to incorporate was based on the fact that the government did not want us to want to give us a raise. So we didn't get a raise. We didn't get increase in salary. So they gave us a mechanism by which we can incorporate and save on taxes. That's the in lieu of, of an increase in salary. So what has happened over the years is that those who have really incorporated early. So in Ontario, I believe it was 2009. Uh, 2006, sorry to oh, correct 2006, you. even better. So, yeah. so those who incorporated in 2006, so those physicians who did that, so have, you know, build a, a, a good retained earning in the corporation and use those retained earnings to invest, right? Like, like they were suggested to, recommended to. Take those retained earnings and invest in mutual funds, e index funds, ETF stocks, whatever. And and those retained earnings that are invested, if they were to retire today under the old rules, the capital gains would be 50% of, of that. Right. But now it's 66.6%. .6%. So a physician who was banking on the fact that they can use a corporation to save on taxes and eventually when they retire, they'll have this golden goose egg that they at least anticipated that they would pay 50% on capital gain. Now, past June 25th, they're like, oh, <laughs> I'm now paying 66% included in the inclusion rate and my 50% of that. So I'm paying more taxes. So I've essentially effectively lost 8%. Uh, so a lot of the physicians are like, uh, I can't retire now. Because yeah, I need to, right. I need to make up that eight percent, so I need to work longer, and so that has been. That's why it's been such a controversial change uh, in this federal budget for professionals like yourself, like lawyers, dentists, and and physicians. Am I explaining this correctly? Yes, you you've got it bang on, and, and uh, you know, and, and also is what's happening inside a corporation. So we're we're talking about uh, the portion that's taxable. But the portion that's not taxable inside a corporation goes to what's called a notional account called a capital dividend account. So again, before June 25th, when you only had 50% taxable, well, the other 50% went into this capital dividend account or CDA for short, and the shareholders could actually extract that money tax-free as a shareholder. You know, so we were we were 
kind of building up that that balance over time and at the rate of 50%. Now, under the new rules, since it's two-thirds taxable, I'm only putting one-third into that CDA account. So that's not growing as fast as I had hoped either. Corporations paying more tax. I'm, as a shareholder, getting less, we'll call them tax-free dividends, from the corporation through that CDA account. So again, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's going to be a mind buster for financial advisors to adjust somebody's uh, long term, you know, retirement plan with these new rates to say, okay, well, how much are we going to end up with in the corp? How much can we pull out on this tax free basis? And uh, just recently, the government came out with some kind of formula that because they used June twenty fifth as a cutoff in twenty twenty four, now you've got a blended rate. So you've got capital gains earned before June 25th and capital gains earned after June 25th. Now there's going to be some discussion as, well, do we use a blended rate or do we use cutoff dates as to exactly when the transactions occurred? Uh, right now that's up in the air and it's up for discussion. Wow. Okay. So two points. So it's not just a single whammy, it's a double whammy because we now pay more taxes on the inclusion rate of 66%. But we also have 33% instead of 50% to put into our CDA. So double whammy. But the second point is I do not want your job right now <laughs> because it's it's so complicated uh, and, and lots of uncertainty for sure. Yeah, well, it keeps us challenged uh, for sure. And, and uh, at the end of the day, it's really, you know, trying to trying to put it in plain English for our clients and and you know, hoping that working with their advisors and everything else, we could still get them retired at a, you know, in a reasonable, reasonable time frame. But like you said, it, maybe you're not retiring at 65. Maybe you have to work, you know, two or three, four more years to uh, to make up this difference. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it definitely has a lifestyle impact uh, and it definitely has a, um, you know, um, health impact because I'm not sure that everybody wants to work another three or four years if already they are unhealthy or or have some medical issues. This now forces them to actually work those extra years. Absolutely. Added pressure for sure. And and uh you know it's you know we're all human as you know and, and things happen beyond our control. Um so if people were anticipating a, a certain age for retirement or you know we always say you want to travel while you can, while you're still healthy. But if you're forced to work uh, an extra few years and that, you know, that has an impact on your body. Uh, maybe I won't be able to travel if I have to work those extra few years. So, so definitely a huge, a huge lifestyle impact. Right. Uh, so golden age is not as golden. And, uh, and the golden goose and the golden goose egg at the end is not as golden anymore. We were laughing earlier it's no, it's no longer gold, maybe silver, or maybe even gone to bronze. Uh, yeah, use, using the recent Olympics, yeah, as an example. <laughs> so, okay, so now we've talked about all the bad things that that is happening. Let's provide uh, the audience a little bit of a light. Uh, so sure. from a tax perspective, from an accounting perspective, and maybe planning perspective, what are some of the fixes for this problem now? All right, I guess we'll we'll start with the best to worst. So good news first, bad news last. What we see our clients getting involved in, uh, the incorporated ones, is a pension plan within that corporation or sponsored by the corporation it is one way to mitigate the capital gains uh, tax, we'll call it, uh, in, the, in that the corporation is funding the pension plan out of corporate dollars, pre-tax corporate dollars. So right off the bat, the corporation is saving 12.2% or 12 .2 tax on that money going into a pension plan. What I like about the pension plan, it's under the Pension Act of Canada, which stipulates that the funds have to earn at least 7.5% rate of return. Uh, so I've saved 12.2 by putting the money in and I have to earn seven and a half once it's in there. So that's that's almost a 20 20% uh, rate of return 
and you haven't invested the money yet. It's it's, it's just set aside in the court in the uh, pension plan. And of course, if it's invested there and it's properly managed, then it, it then it grows, and you're deferring the tax on all of that money. It'll it'll be taxable when it comes out, but the benefit of when you're pulling it out is now I can income split with a spouse. Again, we're we're minimizing the taxes down the road. We're we're deferring them till we're ready to retire. So I'd say the pension plan is probably the the best solution, and and it's uh, it's pretty good in the sense that, uh, or it's easy to get into. I should say, if you have a corporation and you're paying yourself a salary, you know those those are really the two main criteria to set up your own pension plan. And of course, uh, Vu, you have the Canadian Physicians Pension Plan targeted uh, to the healthcare providers and, and physicians. Um, but there's also a personal pension plan like the one I have uh, inside my corporation that's that's funding my retirement ultimately, so I can speak of it. That's probably the, the easiest, best solution. The next one down would be what they call a whole life insurance policy or participating life insurance policy, where part of your premiums are paying for life insurance, but the other part is going towards an investment account within a life insurance uh, policy. So very much like a pension plan, these things are creditor proof. They're funded by your corporation. The premiums can be paid by the corporation for these life insurance policies, albeit not tax deductible life insurance premiums, because the benefit when a person passes away does come to you or to your beneficiaries tax free. So there's not really a tax deferral in that sense, but you have sheltered growth within the life insurance policy. And with these uh, types of policies, your premium remains the same forever, regardless of your age and your health. Um, and after X number of years, you've kind of paid for the insurance portion of it. And as you keep contributing, it's just exponentially growing the investment side of it. So people say, well, yeah, okay, but how how does that help me? Well, with a life insurance policy of that type, you have two options. You can actually use it as a bank and borrow directly from the policy and get that money out well before you pass away and use those funds to retire. Or the other way is you could walk into a bank with the policy. The bank knows you're going to pass away, so they'll give you up to 90% of the value of that policy of the cash value of that policy as a loan and you use that cash to retire and then when you retire the life insurance policy pays off that loan for you so the that's i say the second best and then when you get into investing inside a corporation then you're talking about you know rental properties which we talked about before rental income is taxed as you go then you're getting hit with the capital gains on the ultimate sale um, you can buy stocks and ETFs, mutual funds. There again, if there's capital gains, you're paying as you go. Um, there are certain corporate class investments that allow you to defer some of those uh, capital gains. And in fact, some types of insur uh, t some types of investments out there in a corporate class will actually convert interest and other types of income into capital gains for the benefit of being not 100% taxable. So those are kind of the, the three big categories for investing inside of a corp. Outside of a corp, you can defer the taxes on the capital gains if you're in a registered account like an RSP. So if I have bought stocks inside my RSP and I cash them out and I'm buying and I'm selling and I'm growing my portfolio within the RSP, You'll only pay tax on those capital gains when you withdraw the money from the RSP itself, but then it becomes 100% taxable from an RSP. Yeah, you're not directly affected by these changes in the um, capital gains tax inclusion rates, but down the road, you know, you're going to have that money is fully taxable coming out of your RSP. So those right. are kind of the 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 top to bottom. Uh, <laughs> ways of, of mitigating your taxes or deferring taxes and and not get trapped into this uh capital inclusion rate uh problem on the immediate side correct exactly so if i were to summarize those fixes or those mitigation strategies 
uh, I'll, I'll repeat them and you let me know if I'm I'm uh, 100% correct on this or you should make some changes to what I'm saying. So if I say the best mitigation strategy would be a pension plan, the second best mitigation strategy would be a whole life insurance. Correct. Uh, a third partial mitigation strategy would be a RRSP outside of your corporation. And then finally, a non-reg account within your corporation, but maybe invested in corporate class type of assets as opposed to non-corporate class assets. Uh, and then finally, something we didn't talk about, but maybe a family trust, but the family trust is also considered a non-reg account at that point inside the corporation. So if I say number one, pension, the best, number two, whole life insurance, Number three, outside of the corporation, the RRSP. And in place number four, which is not even a bronze, but in place number four is the non-reg account with corporate class type of assets. So if I classified it that way, uh, am I being as accurate as possible? Yes, exactly. That's right. So inside the corp, you've got three options, the pension plan, the life insurance, and the corporate class. And outside the corp would be your um, well, and then you see RSPs, and and then in both cases, the last option, which is a uh, I call it a pay as you go option, is is non registered accounts where you're paying tax immediately uh, as the capital gains are being triggered, so there is no deferral. So uh, we've talked about the 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 why the what and the how and the fixes is there anything else that we uh didn't address that you wanted to add about this well we we still want to talk about uh the rules around the tax on passive income um just to mention with with these investments inside a corporation um those corporations that are eligible for what they call the small business tax, which is the 12.2% mm -hmm. versus the 26 and a half percent. If your profits are higher, your business profits are higher than half a million dollars. Uh, those who are under that uh, half million bar uh, benefit from a lower corporate tax rate. However, if your investment income inside your corporation reaches a certain threshold and the government decided it was $50,000, now all of a sudden, anything between one hundred and fifty sorry between fifty thousand and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars investment, you're actually grinding down or, or lowering that half million limit and basically minimizing the taxable income that will be subject to the twelve point two percent, making it eligible, making it uh, exposed, I guess, to the twenty six and a half percent higher tax rate. So uh, again, we want to be careful when we're investing inside a corporation that we're conscious of the limits of the uh, what they call passive income or or investment income that you're earning there too so um it's it's always a juggle with with um with you know i want to earn more but then i'm going to pay more corporate tax or a higher corporate tax rate um so it's just it's just for people to be aware of when you're investing inside a corporation there's a there's a bit of a twist with uh, with being you know especially if you're eligible for that small business deduction limit of twelve point two percent corporate rate tax, right? So uh, the passive income grind, which I I usually call it the pig. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we have to deal with the pig as well. And so what you're saying is, this capital gains inclusion rate increase affects um, the income generated by these passive income. So what you're saying to me, it's even more depressing. So it's a triple whammy, not a double whammy. Yeah, the three little pigs now. Oh my God. So <laughs> Norma, I need to end this conversation because it's making me depressed. So no. so we've got a triple whammy, not a double whammy. Uh, so a lot of moving parts for sure. Um, and definitely need a good accountant to figure all this out for us. Absolutely. And and we work hand in hand with with uh, professional advisors. Um, and in most cases, the ones I've aligned myself with don't really charge uh, for the first visit or even developing the first plan, you know, as a first draft. 
just again to give the clients a, uh, a good perception of what can and cannot happen. Uh, and of course, they have the tools to, you know, extend this out to, you know, age 80 or age 100, you know, what's going to happen over time. Obviously, you know, the, the two biggest things I was told is either you you die too soon or you run out of money too soon. So uh, nobody wants to outlive their money. So this is where uh, we work with, with uh, you know, certified financial planners out there that, that you know, look at the investment side, we look at the tax side, and then come up with a, a, I call it the comprehensive tax plan for the client to, and, and it's revised every year, as we know, you know, we see in 2024, all of a sudden you, you're throwing a curveball with these capital gains inclusion rate that jumps. So now all of a sudden everybody's scrambling to adjust their plans. And, and uh, as you suggested it, you know, yeah, you might be hit with a bit of bad news that you have to work an extra few years to, you know, to comfortably retire. I'll tell you what physicians typically do. Uh, they typically work a few more extra shifts and a few more night shifts. That's that's what physicians tend to do, but not not absolutely not the best solution. <laughs> oh no! Again, and it's going back to the impact on your body, right? You know, um, if if you're if you're working like you know stupid hours now to be able to hit that that you know that target retirement age, you know, are you going to be physically fit to to enjoy retirement or you're going to burn yourself out. So this was a good discussion on on this one very specific topic. I didn't I didn't even realize that we could say so much about it. Um. So before before we end, any parting uh, goose egg, golden nuggets, or things that's burning on your chest that you must say to our audience today? Just align yourself with a good strategic accountant. A uh, tax accountant that will take the time to sit down and explain in plain English what the tax rules are, which ones impact you, how to take advantage of some of them. You know, uh, we always say people, you don't know what they don't know because the tax rules are so complex and there's so many of them. If you're aligned with a good tax accountant, uh, that's half the battle. And then, like I said, the next step would be a good financial advisor working hand in hand to make sure that, you know, you work hard for your money and you want to keep most of it and you want that money to work hard for you and you know and and yourself Vu being uh, head of the Canadian Physicians Pension Plan uh is is a prime example of of a good solution that kind of buffers people from these these radical tax changes thank you very much and i think that's a good message to end on uh, you don't know what you don't know and so get the people that know uh to help you along the way because it makes things much easier and why is that important? And you said it without really saying it, but you've been saying it all along. If you plan properly from taxes perspective, from a estate and a finance perspective, you plan properly, then this will really, really help you with not needing to work longer, faster, harder, therefore avoiding burnout. And, yeah, exactly. And, and and you said those you said those words. I just wanted to make sure that the audience really captures that in one word which is yeah. burnout burnout and 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 even the phrase i like if you if you fail to plan you're planning to fail absolutely so, you know it's a it's a sounds cliche but it's true it's true absolutely true so thank you norma for taking the time this morning i know you have a busy day you probably have multiple people calling you today as well so i appreciate you taking the time and helping us out Always my pleasure, Boo, and and uh, to our audience, uh, you know, if if you're looking for some uh, advice, yeah, please reach out. Thank you very much for listening this far, and I hope that we have answered the question well in regards to the increase in the inclusion rate of the capital gains. Now, what needs to be what needs to be done is you need to figure out what does it mean for me and my family. So this is really the time to get the experts that you need to figure this one out and also figure out what are the best solutions possible for you and your family. Like usual, I'm going to take this opportunity to remind you if you have enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends, your colleagues, your pets, your dog, your parakeet, and even your goldfish if you need to. At the same time, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you that I do provide financial coaching, executive and leadership coaching as well. 
Uh, and I want to remind the audience of our conference for next year, the Code Green Financial Conference, happening on February 15th, 2025, at the Old Mill Inn in Toronto. So please pencil that into your calendar, and uh, we will see you all there. How is My Financial Health Doc podcast is hosted by Dr. Vukit Tran. Dr. Tran is a physician with a special interest in personal financial security and wealth education. Dr. Tran does not render or offer to render personalized investment or tax advice through this financial podcast. The information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute financial, tax, investment, or legal advice. Please confer with your advisor, lawyer, or accountant for specific advice.